My name is William Cam, and um, I've been uh, working with Justice Action for about five years. Uh, previously, uh, when I went to prison, I worked with uh, Brett, and uh, when I came out in 2014, I then applied to, to help him uh, with his work. Uh, my background is uh, pretty well known because uh, I'm a high profile person uh, which means that uh, the media have been uh, spotting me for quite a number of years. And um, my background is that uh, I'm a religious person and what that actually means is that since uh, my early teens I've been working a great deal in uh, the formation of uh, religious practice in reference to my faith. I worked with the state government as well as with the um, people in the, the uh, councils uh, in Shellhaven and we worked together very well until uh, 19, um, oh, sorry, it was 2002, um, I was uh, given a letter, <coughs> excuse me, a letter from a, a close uh, friend of mine. Um, and in this letter uh, given to me, uh, this young girl uh, asked me uh, or actually uh, put it to me that unless uh, I paid money uh, to her and to her friends, uh, she would go to the police and have me charged for sexual harassment. And I said to her, um, by all means do. And of course I kept that letter and within about a month or so uh, I was charged and uh, by the police, even though I was very well known, uh, not only in Nowra, but all over Australia because of my uh, public uh, work that I was doing. So the, the road then became extremely difficult. Because I was in the public eye, the media had, went on a frenzy. Uh, because I had been in media before through the work that I was doing and it was always uh, front page news uh, in uh, the area that I lived as well as in Sydney and other areas. Uh, so I was always in the news uh, very many times because of the church. And anyway, as we progressed, um, we ended up going through trial and uh, I was convicted and then I went to prison in 2005. It took quite a few years to actually get that far. While I was uh, still out, um, I was able to still uh, be on bail before I was convicted. Even after I was convicted, I was still on bail until the sentencing. And uh, I still lived in my community. And but the media uh, uh, harassed me a tremendous amount over all these years. So then the stage was set that I was going to go to prison. And of course we fought that uh, uh, strenuously in court. But we had really no chance uh, because of the media who publicised that constantly. So much so that through all my trials and the time that I was arrested, there was approximately about 400 articles registered uh, of articles in the newspaper uh, <laughs> that was against us. So therefore, to have a fair trial uh, would be impossible. Mm -hmm. But we couldn't do anything about it and uh, we already knew afterwards that uh, there would be no chance for me in, in the court. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the end of it because we then um, uh, proceeded, uh, the normal proceeding is through going through an appeal and things like that. Mm -hmm. And 
even unto this day, which is uh, quite a few years now, nearly 14 years later, um, or so we are still fighting the same fight, and that is to clear my name. And my understanding through my lawyers and through those higher up that my conviction should be overturned uh, in these next uh, 12 months or so. But it's a very long, long drawn out battle. Hmm? And the people that, uh, that put me in jail, uh, what uh, was revealed of course through the court as well as through many channels especially the fact that they asked for money. Uh, and they went uh, to the media before I was even uh, arrested or charged. And they made a media deal with Channel 7 and Channel 9. And this was even before uh, the police ever got involved. Uh, so it's a long story. It's a very long story. But we've been fighting it for a long time. And slowly we are succeeding but it's a very long process. Because of me being a public figure, this caused me many problems in prison. Because when you are labelled with, with an offence like they labelled me, um, prison population is, they hate everybody, especially those. <coughs> you have to excuse me. Um, because it has a stigma. Hmm? You can be, you can be a, a murderer, or you can be a drug addict, or you can be a thief. They are honoured in the prison system. But as soon as you're tagged with a sexual offence, immediately you are honoured as the worst of the worst. And um, it's very, very difficult. From there, um, in my case, they kept me in that dry cell for seven weeks and they were not allowed to. It was against the rules. They were only allowed to leave me in there for seven days because it's total confinement. And uh, they allowed you out for maybe 30 minutes, maybe, sometimes maybe an hour if you're lucky. In that hour, you had to have your shower you had to make a, a phone call if you could hmm? and, um, and then get back in your cell. You didn't have TVs or anything, it was just an empty cell. And uh, you weren't allowed to, to read, you weren't allowed to write, so therefore all you're doing is looking at four walls. And it's no wonder that people go absolutely insane. Hmm? But anyway, we, we got over that situation and they put me then into another, another yard. They have different yards in different groups. But they put me into where uh, the yard people, they could see straight through your, your perplexed window. And these little windows had little holes in them. And what they did, if they knew who you were, they knew about your charge, hmm, they would smoke. And then they'd push the smoke through the through the little holes hmm? to make sure they see if they can fill your cell up with smoke because I was a non-smoker hmm? and uh, they, they would uh, throw excretions through the holes uh, of human uh, um, uh, private uh, matters hmm? and uh, throw mud at you and all sorts of things and you had to survive this. You had to go through this bit by bit by bit. And um, that's only to start off with. Then we've had people that uh, they have what they call inmates that look after inmates uh, who are in charge, for example, for the food and for uh, clothing and for other matters. Well, many times because of the charge, the ones who were in charge, as soon as, see what they did is they mostly threw the f food on the floor. Hmm? And the officers as well as those inmates would kick the food into your cell and lock the door quickly. Sometimes they'll open the door and throw the food into your face. 
Mm -hmm. Talking about hot food. Mm -hmm. So this is the beginning of, of being in prison. And it's quite a shock to the system. Mm -hmm. But over time, and they moved me from section to section because that's what they do until they decide where to put you. Well, they decided according to their matter to, in my case, it was to go to um, Goulburn Jail. And Goulburn Jail is one of the worst jails in Australia. It has a very bad history. It's called the Killing Fields. Hmm? And because there are a lot of killings in Goulburn, and um, what they did is the officers would do this purposely. They are supposed to walk with you, but they didn't. So what they do is to give you an idea is uh, it's like a, a, um, like, a T in, like a T intersection, but you had to walk past all that yardage, open yard, and the inmates would then climb up the fence, which was probably around about maybe 15 to 20 feet high, and take rocks, milk bottles, uh, not milk bottles, but cartons with urine uh, and uh, uh, hard apples and throw it at you and, and excretions at you while you were walking to get to the visiting area. They did this to me many times and the officers just stood back, did nothing. And you don't have uh, any type of freedom whatsoever. Hmm? Um, in the beginning, uh, for example, just to have a phone call, we would be given a time for when I was in MPU. In the beginning, you only had uh, 10 minutes on the day to make a phone call. And if you had more than one person in the family, it's very hard to make a phone call. Mm -hmm. And um, so these are the very small things, but they're very, very important things for an inmate because he doesn't have much. Uh, then you have uh, the many difficulties with visits. Uh, normally speaking, you only get an hour. A lot of people travel hundreds of kilometers to visit that person. And sometimes because of the, the uh, um, authorities, which don't really worry about whether you get 15 minutes or an hour, they don't really worry about the visitors either. Hmm? They cause a lot of problems for visitors because they have to go through screen, screening uh, apparatus, etc. Uh, and uh, and uh, you be touched down and investigated to make sure that you're not carrying anything. Likewise for the inmates, every time you go for a visit, you have to go through a strip search. You're going a strip search going in and a strip search going out, mm, coming back in again. And all of that, apart from it taking its time, is uh, very um, intrusive in your privacy. And uh, also, uh, you are not allowed to go uh, to the toilet, the visitors or yourself. So therefore, with all of the pressures and the strain that is placed upon individuals, are very, very hard. Because uh, if you can't go to the toilet uh, and just say hey, you're gonna have a coffee or whatever with your friends, uh, in most cases you try not to because you might have to run to the loo and once you want to uh, go to the toilet you lose your visit mm? because it was high profile I was targeted a fair bit in prison uh, first of all for my life and my uh, I got death th threats uh, and brought up to my attention by those in authority but the only thing the authority says well just watch your back well, it's not exactly easy to watch your back when half of the place uh, hates your guts, excuse the expression. And, uh, but, uh, it was a situation in uh, Yellow Yard, it was called in Goulburn, 
And what happened there was uh, I was placed in a cell with a person who had murdered his inmate, his celly, murdered him, cut him into pieces and flushed him down the toilet. And the only reason they could find out that that, that actually happened was that the bones were too big to flush down the toilet. So that they placed me in the cell with that person, which was against regulation. Hmm? And of course they don't really care, I can assure you, they don't care. Um, there's no uh, real welfare for the inmates and there's not really much care for inmates overall. Hmm? And that is all hidden from the public, but the public really don't care whether an inmate ha is uh, able to survive or live in prison or not. And as far as they are concerned, is they're just prisoners and they're criminals, so therefore they don't belong to society. But what people don't see is the fact is that these people may be criminals and they may have made a mistake in their life. But uh, a criminal is not rehabilitated. I guarantee you that. No criminal is rehabilitated in prison. Hmm? Um, and they know that. Matter of fact, um, when you place a criminal in prison, uh, what happens is the prisoner becomes a worse criminal because it injects it within the system. Hmm? And the archaic laws that Australia has, as well as corrective services, create criminals, not reduce them. Hmm? And, um, and that can be seen even on, on uh, official records that uh, if one studies them, can see that that is not the case, that um, there's no rehabilitation at all. It's just that a person is forced into that situation and sadly, that's how it is. Something that I need to say, which hasn't been said yet, and it's relating to health care in prison. It's deplorable. If you wanted to have a, uh, just say if you had a headache, hmm, um, and um, you needed uh, Panadol, for a start, you wouldn't get it. You'd have to, if you wanted to have that, you'd have to go in line uh, to a little uh, door to ask, can I have a Panadol? In most cases, they won't give it to you. What they say is, put it in a, a written form and put it in a box. In other words, that you want that. Of course, they won't look at that for probably about three or four days. By that time, your headache's gone. Mm. But the other problem is too, uh, is the dentists. If you've got a tooth uh, problem, that can take months. You can have a, a decaying tooth and it will take months for you to actually get to see the dentist. By that time you've already got a cyst and all the nurses will give you is a Panadol to help you to uh, live that pain. Now I don't know if you've ever had a, a toothache, but if you have a toothache, a serious toothache, and you cannot get Panadol or you cannot get anything to alleviate that pain. It can be one of the worst pains that a human body can actually have. And by the end result of all of that, what actually happens is if, the, if they can't repair the tooth, they just rip it out. So therefore you lose many teeth because they do not give you uh, caps on your teeth to protect them. And this is only just a small item of the terrible treatment of inmates in prison. But I'll give you one example of a terrible situation. That all of these I experienced myself. I had what's called cellulitis in my left leg. Cellulitis is when there's an infection within the leg uh, through um, through the veins. Uh, it's like varicose veins but it's far worse. And if it's not looked at, 
you can get gangrene and the leg gets amputated. And a few inmates have had their legs amputated because what happens is the medical staff don't look after you. Hmm? And it was so bad, this was back in 2011, that my leg, I had uh, cellulitis and they looked at it and they said, oh, that's all right, that's no problem. Of course, you're hobbling around with a swollen leg hmm? and you had to work. Hmm? If you didn't work with, within two days, you would first of all lose the job and second of all, you get moved to another area in prison, which no one wants. Hmm? So anyway, I had this, but I had very good officers, very good officers. They were very humane and I got along very well with them. And they got along well with me too. We became really good friends. And um, what happened is that um, finally I ended up getting to go to the nurse and the officer, not the nurse, but the officer was saying that man needs to go to hospital because that's pretty serious. Right? And um, anyway, um, so I ended up going to hospital and what they do is they take you in this tin can, which is a tiny little van. They shove you in the back with, the, with, the, with your um, cuffs on. In my case, I, I wasn't supposed to get my cuffs on because I had a C classification. When you have a C classification, you don't have handcuffs. Hmm? But uh, as a lot of uh, officers hated me, uh, they always made sure that it would be more painful. And it does because it's a tiny little, little uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, a seating in that you're locked in the back like, like you see with the police vans, tiny little thing in the back, and you're locked in there with cuffs on and it's all steel. Hmm? and they write and drive like, <laughs> like going out of style and not caring about what's uh, sitting in the back. Mm -hmm. And anyway, the officers who took me wouldn't help me to get stepped down from there, so I nearly fell a few times. And they wouldn't help me to walk from where I was in the hospital yard to the hospital emergency. So I had to drag my leg to get up there and they were dragging me on my cuffs. And they made sure that you go through the foyer, the front foyer, in front of all the public so they can see that you are a, an inmate. Hmm? And uh, as soon as I did go in though, they immediately said, that's serious. Hmm? So I ended up in hospital then for three days on a drip. But I was in a section uh, it's especially uh, quarantine for inmates. Mm. But you are treated very, very badly there, even by nurses, because I know who inmates, right? So you don't get any, anything special there. And the same thing is when you go back. But one of the worst things that happened is that uh, I had uh, cancer uh, on my skull. Mm. And of course you wouldn't see it now, but I had cancer, very serious cancer. But the doctors and the nurses in the, in the prison, as well as the, the hospital, uh, because you're an inmate, you're a second a secondary citizen, they didn't look after it. It was a tiny little dot, tiny dot. The officers looked after me and they had arguments with the nurses uh, that I should be in hospital. Mm? And uh, it took five weeks just to get to see the doctor and finally determine, oh, well, we're not sure whether it is cancer or not. So it, ha it started to grow very rapidly uh, until it was a, 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 a 50 cent piece size from a tiny dot. And Eventually, by the time I went in and out of hospital for the, for the specialist to look at it, hmm, 
uh, they said, oh yeah, well it is cancer, you know, finally, after 14 weeks they decided that it's cancer. Uh, but by that time, it had grown already that much that it became a serious matter. So, and the doctor, a specialist said, well, I'm glad we caught it in time because within, uh, within a month you'd be dead. Mm. So they operated on, but instead of taking uh, only a small section, they took a section that large. Mm. That means flesh and all. They didn't tell me, of course. Um, but that was a very, very uh, a terrible experience. So uh, prison itself is very bad. If any person says that prison's great or good, they need to have their heads looked at. Mm? Prison is, uh, to me, is, is not a place where you uh, uh, learn to adjust in as much as to say, well, I'm, I'm an evil person, I've done wrong, and you're going to have remorse uh, uh, for the crime that you committed. All of this is total baloney. Mm? Because the point is, when we're talking about remorse, right, they have all these courses that you have to do and you have to get to the point of having remorse. Mm? Very, very few people have remorse in a situation like that. Only if it affects them personally on, on a personal level do you have remorse. In other words, if I thieved for example, yes, well, I'm sorry I thieved that person. But, you know, he comes out and he thieves again. Mm -hmm. Because how are you going to rehabilitate a person that just stole? What are you going to do? What, you think that a paperwork of psychology is going to convince you that you shouldn't steal? The only thing that will stop you from that is, of course, prison life. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, that prisoner who was maybe a mild prisoner becomes a violent prisoner or aggravated prisoner because of the way he was treated. Mm. I think one other very important aspect to consider is about the smoking regulations in the prison. As you know, since uh, last year, I think it was last year, uh, new laws came in uh, of non-smoking in the prison system. Now. The public won't realise and know um, how bad that is for prisoners because for a start they have very little to go on and most of them are smokers. So therefore if you're a smoker and have been maybe for 10 years or so and all of a sudden you're throw in, thrown in the clink and you're told you can't smoke, you're going to have terrible withdrawal systems. Mm. That goes also for the officers, they had the same problem. And to think that you need uh, um, uh, free air uh, zone areas when we've got a, a massive earth to take up anything that's regarding smoking, which is really a very small item, uh, is absolutely ludicrous. Because what does it do to a person? I don't smoke, by the way. But to a person that smokes, it's very vital. Because it, regardless, no one's telling him, well, you're going to have a better health uh, uh, by not smoking. A person in prison doesn't care a hoot about his health huh? uh, because uh, all he wants is something to do. And smoking was one thing that relaxed him and was able to uh, 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 live in an environment that is a very, very hostile anyway. So to take that away from him, it's, it's like taking um, a teddy bear away from a child. Huh? It's similar or taking something that uh, is very precious to him uh, or her and take it away and say you can't have it. Um, but in a smoking uh, environment for a, a person that does smoke, uh, it's very detrimental, uh, more detrimental to health than what the authorities claim uh, because it's, it's cutting off something that he needs to keep him calm. And the thing is this, that, uh, so what do they do instead is uh, they'll give him uh, sedatives or things uh, to replace that 
or they give him things, well, go and chew on some more chocolate uh, and, uh, and sweets, which means you have to buy it anyway. Um, so therefore, to me, that is more detrimental by having that uh, placed in the system than, take, than, than allowing them to have it. Uh, hygiene is something that's so important, but it's, uh, it's uh, very much neglected because, for example, uh, in, in our case, we had pillows. You wouldn't, you wouldn't allow an animal to sleep on those pillows that we had, hmm? and they were filthy. And if you leave your cell and you go uh, into another cell or into another prison, those same pillows are used uh, by another person. Now you can have any, any type of diseases, and that goes the same with the, with the uh, mattresses. Some of the mattresses are absolutely filthy. <laughs> I've re-established myself and I've uh, formed a new political party uh, which is also reg is not registered yet by the government but the government knows about it because they've written to me. Um, it's a political party for the purpose of uh, prisoners and it's called the Republic Reform and Justice Party. Uh, we have our own website already, we have barristers and lawyers and, and people in business and private sector that are very interested in the new uh, political party. And what it is, it's basically to change the justice system. It needs to be changed drastically. Hmm? And that prisoners are treated as human beings, not as numbers. Hmm? And most people forget that every prisoner has a family. And and I'm not talking about one or two families. They could have many families or the extended family. So therefore, when a person goes to jail, not only does he go to jail or she, but their family does too, living on the outside under the yoke of the criminal effect placed upon, the, upon their husbands or fathers or mothers or brothers or whatever. In other words, everyone becomes a prisoner in a different way. So therefore they suffer too because uh, the way it's done when you go and visit uh, an inmate, they, the visitors are degraded and treated like that too hmm? and in a very bad way. So therefore it has an effect upon many members and, uh, and through the new political party that I'm trying to form is I want that changed. I want the attitude of the public changed because you never hear of politicians talk about prisons generally at elections. All their, all their statement is let's make it harder for the prisoners. Let's make it difficult for them. In other words, give them long sentences. Uh, in other words, they're not really part of society anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Because a lot of prisoners, uh, when they do come back into society, can change and can make a difference. And there have been many great uh, historical people who were in prison who became great members in society. So, have you found any sort of support Oh, yeah, the media has. The, I think the most, apart from my family, but the most support that I've had for, and friends uh, would be probably uh, Brett and his uh, community that he has in here. Um, generally speaking, uh, I've had a, a reasonable amount of support from the public sector in as much as when I go to doctors or go to, to um, specialists or things like that. Um, I've had pretty good support there in as much as a lot of them know that I've been in prison and, uh, and they support me very well, ethically wise. Uh, and because I'm also involved in the, the, the um, justice system, uh, I've had a tremendous support there. 
and because I'm working with lawyers and I've got wo lawyers working for me too, mm, doing my case still. Mm, uh, and uh, being involved with them has helped me a great deal. Uh, in some cases, ev even our parole officer, uh, our parole officer uh, that I have is a very good parole officer. We mustn't paint the authorities or those who have got a duty to do with the same brush. You can get good ones and you can get bad ones. I've had bad ones and good ones. The good one that I have currently is very, very good. Uh, but she is also, so also subdued by the authorities in as much as, you know, you've got to do this and this and this. So we've had support there. But it's not really the, the real support that you need. But uh, then we have a, a situ situation, uh, for example, about the media. I think I did mention it before too. To me, um, the way that media deal with, with uh, criminals is in such a way that they remain a criminal for the rest of their lives. In other words, they can't rehabilitate, they can't have any chance of coming back into the world and try to relive, uh, relive their lives, to correct their lives. Uh, constantly they're on their goat the whole time through uh, in all of the history of their lives. In other words, once you commit one crime, therefore that means you have to be a criminal until you're 105. Hmm? But uh, what about a person that does change his life? What about a person who does correct it and does make amends? Right? The system that we have now is, uh, is like the parole system. You finish parole and then they go for an extended parole. Huh? Which means uh, you're under the yoke of the authorities the whole time. I just believe that the justice system has to change. Hmm? And I mean, there's many, many more things on that, uh, but most of the prison system has to change. Uh, they have to be treated as human beings mm, and given a fair go. And, and at the same time, the, the true victims, they need to be uh, upheld, protected, uh, and, uh, and true justice needs to be meted out. And as for the advocacy group of Justice Action, I've been a member of that for quite some years and worked with them. And I think Brett and his team and teams are doing a wonderful job to communicate to the needs of prisoners. And, uh, and they should support this work too because it is a wonderful work. And I wish God's blessing on all concerned. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. you.